Hey everybody, I'm Pastor Jody. And I'm Pastor Patrick. We're here today to tell you about our exciting VBS family experience. This is gonna be an awesome VBS family experience for all of our families that have elementary age children. That's right, moms and dads, we want you here as well. So, we're giving you two options to choose from. We're giving you a Monday and Tuesday night option on July 20th and 21st, or a Wednesday, Thursday option on July 22nd and 23rd. And we're gonna pack this night with everything that your kids know and love about VBS. There will be worship songs, there will be Bible drama, there will be funny skits, and maybe even a chance to win some awesome prizes. So as you can tell, we're dressed up and ready to go. We're hopping on to the Rocky Mountain Railway where Jesus' power pulls us through. So go to oakwoodandbee.com slash VBS to find out more information and sign your family up today. We promise you don't want to miss this. Hello, welcome to Worship With Us at Oakwood. We're so glad that you're joining us wherever you happen to be. We're gonna sing together. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the I raise a hallelujah And my weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah And heaven comes to fight for me And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the song
right, come on, let's do it together. I'm gonna sing a little louder in the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder, louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. Hell, because to fight for me. Sing a little louder. I'm gonna sing in the middle. Continue to worship together. see it 
I'll let you stay out. Stay out as late as you want. You want to borrow the new car? You want to borrow my credit card? Kids today, they really have it rough. I have no idea where we are or where we're going. I mean, when I was their age, life was easy. Super easy. Why haven't you gotten a tattoo yet? How come you don't have any piercings yet? Yep, we're lost. We are completely lost. Ooh, sports. It, it, just do whatever the mechanic says to do. Vehicle maintenance is completely overrated. Look, whatever the mechanic is asking, just pay him. Pay him whatever he wants. I wish they had soap operas at night. I like that boy. You should date him. You should date him immediately. Well, what about the creepy guy with the motorcycle? He's cute. Yeah, sure. Spring break in Tahiti sounds fun. Hey, make sure you get all your video games done before you start your homework. You don't have to pass all your classes. What? You have a project due tomorrow and you've known about it for four weeks and you haven't started yet? Sweet! Doesn't anybody want to know if we're there yet? Remember, if you need anything between midnight and 4 a.m., please come wake me up. Hey, I'm on the phone. Could you bring the baby over and let him climb all over me? Hey! Hey, can you please turn that music up? Well, we just stopped for lunch 10 minutes ago, but yeah, let's stop again. I never have trouble with my toddler. I never have trouble with my teenagers. I never have trouble with my adult children. You know, she's right. We are ruining her life. Yes, more homework to correct. All right, whining. Yay, tantrums. Mmm, vomit. We just really need to spoil these kids more. Sorry, buddy. I don't know any good jokes at all. You're 16. You pretty much know everything now. I think 18's a great age to get married. Okay, remember, make sure you turn on all the lights before you leave the house. Hey, could you leave the front door open for a couple hours? Thanks. Whoa, money really does grow on trees. Well, those are definitely things that you're never going to hear a father say. But I want to say welcome. So glad to have all of you. Uh, welcome, fathers. Good to, good to have you with us this morning. And uh, guys, may I just remind you, may I remind you of what the Lord calls us to. He says to be men that are sober-minded, be men that are temperate, show yourself to be an example in everything. May those be the kind of men that we are. But uh, happy Father's Day to you. Happy Father's Day to you all. Let's pray together. Lord, we do just come and uh, we thank you for fathers. 
We thank you for our own fathers and the impact that they had in our own life. But Lord, most of all, we thank you that, that you are our eternal father. And as the scripture says, you're a good father that we can turn to, that we can trust in. And so Lord, we pray that today that uh, we would worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, you have been good to us. We pray and ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. One of the things that we often forget is that the kingdom of God is made up of all different types of people, so many faces. And so this song is a song to remind us that all will bow, all will confess, all will shout hallelujah. All the poor and powerless All the lost and lonely All the thieves will come confess Know that you are holy And know that you are holy And all will sing our hallelujah, and we will cry our hallelujah. All the hearts who are content, and all who feel unworthy. All who heard with nothing left will know that you are holy, will know that you are holy, and all will see. Hey Oakwood, happy Father's Day to you. It is uh, great to be with you today. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, just a couple of things to let you know about. One is that uh, our services have schedule has changed. Uh, now it's going to be at 8 and 9.30 at a, and 11 o'clock on Sunday. And there is no need to make any reservations for those services. Uh, next week on June the 28th, uh, if you're not here at church, 
uh, we'll be observing communion together. And so if you're going to watch from home, uh, you might want to get uh, those elements prepared. Uh, and uh, if you don't have grape juice and all of that, just get something to be able to use with your family to be a part of communion. And that'll be Sunday, uh, June the 28th. Uh, would you bow with me in prayer as we begin today? Father, we are grateful to you for your goodness to us. We are grateful that the privilege we have to worship you, the privilege we have to open your word. And Father, we ask now that you would speak into our lives, that your word would take root in us and that it would grow, that we would become more of who you want us to be, that Father, we truly would have a clear vision of you and a clear vision of what you want us to be and how you want us to walk with you in our everyday lives. So Father, speak to us today, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. You know, one thing that is true, I think, probably about all of us is that we all want to be liked. We all want to be loved. But we really don't want to be the outsider. We really don't want to be the person that nobody wants to be around. And so really, in life, we do a lot to try to be liked to try to be loved, to try to be the person that is not on the outside, but on the inside. Well, today in your Bible reading, as you started reading on this Sunday, June the 21st, you're starting to read about a man we're going to talk about today, and his name was Amos. And what's so interesting about Amos is, is that Amos is going to show up on the scene, and he is going to carry with him an extremely unpopular message that is going to go uh, counter against all the thinking of that present day. Amos is not a man that is seeking to be liked. Amos is not a man who's seeking to be loved and admired. Amos is a man that God has given him a word to speak from God. And Amos is going to do that. Whether or not somebody likes it or not, he is going to tell them, what God has got to say. So if you have your Bibles, open with me to Amos. And if you uh, can't find it, that's a good time to use that table of contents because we're going to look at Amos today and just kind of walk through this book. And as you're reading it through the early part of this week and today in the early part of this week, I think it might give you a better understanding of what Amos is trying to say. So let's learn about Amos, first of all, in Amos chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, the words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, when he saw what he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Uzziah was the king of Judah and Jeroboam, the son of Joash, was king of Israel, he said, the Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pasture of the shepherds dry up and the top of Carmel withers. And so what we first of all know about the life of Amos is that Amos is not a professional prophet. Amos is a working man. Amos is a guy who was nothing more, he tells us later, than a shepherd and a man who tended the sycamore, tended the fig trees. He was a guy who had a real job. Not, not your preacher type. He had a real job. But God had spoken to him and said, hey, I want you to go and I want you to proclaim my words concerning Israel. Now, he's coming from Judah, where Uzziah is the king. And he's going to Israel, and he's going to tell them, this is what God says to you. And what's interesting about this talk is, is that when, when Amos is saying this, he is talking to a people that are living in incredible prosperity. Times are good. And it is never a great time or never, never a popular message when someone in the midst of good times comes with a warning of ruin, with a warning of destruction. In fact, if you look in Amos chapter 2, verse 15, he says to them, he says in Amos 2, 15, he says, your archers will not stand their ground and the fleet-footed soldiers will, will not get away. The horseman will not save his life even the bravest warriors will flee naked on that day. What in the world is Amos saying? Amos is saying, those of you in Israel who take such pride in your armed forces, you take such pride in the accuracy of your archers, you take such pride in the strength of your soldiers. Hey, there's going to be a day they're going to run 
crying like a baby, and they're going to run and hide. Now, when the people heard that, they said, man, you've got to be crazy. We have the strongest military on the face of the earth. In chapter 3, verse 15, he says in a time of real prosperity in their life, he says, I, I will tear down your winter house along with your summer house. The houses adorned with ivory will be destroyed and the mansions will be demolished, declares the Lord. You see, these people were so prosperous. They had multiple homes. <laughs> they had their home and they had a winter house and then they had a summer house. And God is saying, hey, there is going to be a day of ruin that's coming. And the people didn't want to hear that. The people don't want to hear a message of ruin in a time of prosperity. Because normally what happens in the midst of a people that are in prosperity is it's not so much financial uh, reversal that comes that brings about a change in the country or ruin in the country. No, it's not from outside forces. It's normally from inside forces. It's from a lack of character. It's from a lack of integrity. It's from a lack of depth in people's lives. And that's exactly what God is targeting in the people of Israel. So Amos meets on this big day. It was a festival day, and he begins to preach. Now, this guy is a country preacher. And so he gets up, and he starts out. And you don't, when you, as you read this, you'll think, man, uh, this guy kind of knew a good strategy, a, a good psychology to use on the people of Israel. Because he starts out, with God's judgment on their neighboring countries. <laughs> Quickest way to build a relationship, isn't it? Is to start talking about a, an agreed on enemy, talking bad about them, building together that connection. That's exactly what Amos is doing. He first starts talking about Damascus. God's people hated Damascus. They hated those people. And so, so when, when, when Amos started talking about how God's going to bring judgment on them, they said, man, we love this sermon. Where did this guy come from? I love this preaching. Preach, brother, preach. And then he goes on to the next country of Gaza and he talks about Tyre and Edom. All these are enemies to the north, south, and all around uh, of Israel. And when he's preaching about the judgment coming on these people, when he talks about the judgment of coming against Judah, all the people of Israel are saying to themselves, this guy we got to hear more from. But then he stops and he turns the attention and the spotlight of God off from the neighboring countries and he puts it right on Israel. And he says, here is God's problem with you. Here is God's word for you. And what Amos is going to show the people of Israel is, is that they better start taking God seriously. This past week, I've been reading uh, from a book I've had for many years by uh, Dr. Stuart Briscoe, pastor, longtime pastor in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And his book on the minor prophets is just simply entitled, Taking God Seriously. Taking God Seriously. And that's what Amos is saying. He said, you're living in prosperity, but you're not taking God seriously. You're not taking the word of God seriously. And so when he turns their attention to them, he says in chapter 2, when he gets to Israel, this is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not turn my back, my wrath. That they sell the righteous, they sell the righteous for silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as upon the dust of the ground. They did deny justice to the oppressed. A father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge in the house of their God. They drink wine and they, they're taken as fines. Now, now what, is, what is Amos saying? Amos is saying that, that the people of God have had total disregard of the needs of others. Uh, the word silver there is really code word for debt. In other words, they discovered, some of the wealthy discovered that they could form these monopolies and they could drive out the smaller farmers and they could make them servants to them. Back in those days when you couldn't pay your debts. Back in those days when you couldn't pay your taxes. 
that the only option was not bankruptcy. The only option was to sell yourself into slavery. To sell yourself into slavery to pay the debts. And Amos says, you have, you have no regard for, for the poor. You have no regard for justice of the oppressed. Now in the Bible, the word justice is a very important word. Well, when we think about the poor in our lives or somebody who's needy, or as we say today in our terminology, someone under-resourced, uh, we think that of that as, as a way of charity. But in the Bible, it's not about charity. It's about justice. In fact, that's what Deuteronomy, if you remember when we read in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 10, verse 17, the, the Bible says, For the Lord your God is, is, uh, is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, and he shows no partiality and he accepts no bribes and he defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. And you are to love those who are aliens, for you yourself were the same when you were in Egypt. Well, what God is saying is, he is saying is justice is being concerned about the needs of others not taking advantage of those that are the most vulnerable. When it talks about justice for those that are vulnerable, there's usually a quartet of people that are mentioned. And that is the, the, the widow, uh, the, the orphan, the fatherless, uh, the alien, and then the poor. And what God sees is, is, is that God says, listen, I don't like how you're treating these people. I don't like how you are pressing them. I don't like how you're taking advantage of them. And God says, I've had enough of that. I'm tired of that. And we're not going to do that. We're not going to follow that pattern. Notice what he says in verse uh, 10 uh, of chapter 4. He says, you hate the one who reproves in court and you despise him who tells the truth. You trample on the poor and you force them to give you grain. Therefore, uh, though you have built stone mansions, you'll not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you'll not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offenses and how great are your sins. You oppress the righteous, and you take bribes, and you deprive the poor justice in the courts. Amos is saying, God says, I've had enough of this. You're not just going to blatantly mistreat people. You're not just blatantly going to continue to trample on the needs of others and simply to ignore justice. The Bible's talking about justice. What others deserve in life as well is our care and our concern as God's people. That's why when you hear the term social justice, that's not some kind of code word that means something evil. No, social justice is, is what God's talking about here. He's talking about justice for all of those that are a part of society, not taking advantage of others, not neglecting, not oppressing other people. He's saying, that's not what I want from you. Do you understand that the heart, that the heart of the gospel is that every person matters to God? Do you understand there is, if, 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 not, if every person does not matter to God, uh, then, then how does that tie in to the good news of the gospel? And God says, I don't, I don't want you to mistreat these people. I don't want you to oppress these people. While you live in luxury and you find ways to keep others down, there's some incorrect, uh, politically incorrect passages in this. Uh, if you notice in, on the screen, in, in, in chapter 4, verse 1, Amos says, Hear this word, you, you cows of Basham on Mount Samaria, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy and say to your husband, uh, bring us some drinks, bring us some drinks. What is he saying here? He's saying that there were ladies at that time that didn't do anything but sit around and tell their husband, oh, bring me some more to drink. 
And the whole time they were living in luxury, spending all their time doing what they wanted to do, spending their energy being what they wanted to be, at the same time oppressing the poor. And Amos says, you, you cows of Basham. I read in one commentary, it said, well, obviously Amos was not a trained preacher, which is very true. You don't call 60% of the congregation uh, cows. But anyway, he said, he, said, he said also, he said, obviously Amos did not know uh, the meaning of the modern day meaning of that word. Well, of of course not. But that doesn't minimize what Amos is saying and the strong language that he's saying. Whether he understood the meaning in 2020 of calling someone a cow doesn't make any difference. He still called them a cow. And when the people hear this, I'm going to tell you something. They're not happy anymore. They're not happy anymore. Like the old church joke of the preacher that got up and he said, today I'm going to talk about sin. And there was a lady in the back of the church said, man, it's about time. I hope he gives it to him good. And so he's talking about the sin of adultery and the sin of pornography and the sin of gambling and the sin one right after another. And then he shifted gears and he started talking about gossip. And the old lady looked over to her friend and said, now he's gone from preaching into meddling. Isn't that true today? Isn't that true today? You see, it's not, it's not hard if I got up to preach to you, share with you uh, against sin, something that's some hot issue, got up to talk to you about the, the evils of, 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 of sexual uh, relationships outside of marriage, if I got up to talk to you about the evils of same-sex marriage, if I got up to talk to you about uh, pornography and the, the degradation of women, if I got up to talk to you about abortion, if I got up and talked to you about uh, judges that are legislating things and taking away social liberties, oh, man, amen, amen, preach it on, Pastor Ray. I'm finally glad to hear some good words, but, but when the spotlight gets on us, on our pride, on our selfishness, on our looking the other way, when we see injustice in our world, of us looking the other way and putting our fingers in our ears to the cries of people that are needy and hurting in our own nation and around the world? Start talking about that kind of stuff? Start talking about how we ought to be more sacrificial in our lives and caring for others? Now, Pastor Ray, what's wrong with him? He's, why is he in a bad mood today? Why has he got to talk to us like that? That's exactly what happens here. People are tired of hearing this. They don't want to hear this from Amos. This is not the kind of, well, go back to talking about judgment on other people. Don't, don't talk about the spotlight on me. And what's interesting in Amos' time is that there was another preacher on the scene as well. And we find him in, in chapter 7, verse 10. His name is Amaziah. Amaziah was the priest, it says in verse 10, of Bethel. That's where he lives. And he's the head guy in that town of Bethel. He is the priest in Bethel. So he is the religious man in Bethel. And here's what he says. He sent a message to Jer Jeroboam, the king of Israel, and lies about Amos. He says, Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. This gad has come down to the heart of our city started preaching this crazy stuff, and, and he's after you, Jeroboam. The land cannot bear his words, for this is what Amos is saying. He never said this. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile away from its native land. He didn't say that. He said God is tired of them abusing and God is tired of them trampling on the needs of others. God is tired of their self-indulgent life of prosperity and wealth at the expense of others. That's what God has said. He lies about him. Amaziah is not really a man of God. Amaz Amaziah is in the pocket of the king. Now, there are two things I grab from that. They're not on the outline. They're just two things that come down to me. Number one is this, is there's always going to be men of God, preachers of the gospel, preachers of God, let's say that, not preachers of the gospel, preachers from, from, that are sent from God or say they're claimed from God uh, that will tell people what they want to hear, that will tell people a popular message. 
that will tell people that they're all good and just keep doing what you're doing and life is good and let the good times roll. There is always going to be, always going to be people who claim to be men and women of God that are going to say those things. Secondly, secondly, here's a key thing. Here's a key thing. That the closer that the man of God gets to power, the more he is hesitant to speak truth to power. The closer a man of God gets to power, the more he will defend and defend the status quo and overlook those things that are unpopular. And that's exactly what this would-be priest of God, Amaziah, is doing. In fact, notice what he says. He says to Amos in verse 12, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore here. We don't want to hear it. We ain't got time for it. We're in a good times and we're in a time of prosperity. Let the good times roll. We don't want to hear your old negative, hateful, mean message of God's judgment. Get out of here. And you go back home. The people of God, when they hear Amos' message, they offer two excuses. They offer two excuses. The first excuse is found in Amos chapter 3. And it is one that they have often used. They say, hear the word of the Lord has spoken against the people of Israel, against the whole family. I brought you out of Egypt. And here's the quote. And, and you, you only have I chosen of all the families on the earth. He says in verse 3, but, but two walk together, can, do, do two walk together unless they, they can agree to do so? You see what he's saying there is that the children of Israel, the first thing they said is, hey, well, we're God's chosen people, man. We're God's chosen people. Well, we, 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 we're all squared away. God chose us. Isn't that the way a lot of times modern day Christians think too? Hey, man, I'm under the grace of God. Hey, God, God's a good God. I'm under His grace. I'm, I'm His chosen. Because they were God's chosen people doesn't mean that God says, you can live and do anything you want to do. You can treat anybody the way you want to treat them. You can act. You can oppress. You can not do justice. Uh, you can live in luxury while others are in need. You, you, God's not saying that. You see, there's nothing wrong with having uh, and, and enjoying the blessing that God has given us. The problem is, the problem is when we neglect others in the process. The second thing that they said to God is, is that, hey, not only are we God's chosen people, he says, they say also, they say, man, we're, 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 we're good Christian people, if you will. Well, we're good people. We, we, we go to church all the time. In fact, notice what he says in chapter 5, where God says, I, I hate your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps but let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. You know what God is saying? God is saying, man, I don't want to hear about your religion. I can't stand your religion. I don't want to hear your songs. I don't want to hear. I like what O.A.W. Tozer said, said most Christians don't lie with their words. They lie when they sing. <laughs> They sing songs about God, sing songs about the life that God calls them to live and the song about what they are living, but it's not the truth. It's not the truth of who we really are. God says, I don't want to hear about how often you go to church. I don't want to hear about how you bring me offerings. I don't want to hear about how you bring me choice grain offerings. I don't like them. I don't want them because your heart, your lips speak that you love me, but your heart is far away from me. That's exactly what God is saying. Is that true of us? Is that true of us? What would God say about church today in our world, in our nation, in our own individual church? What would God say, man, I wish y'all stopped singing. I don't want to hear your songs anymore. I don't want to hear about your deeds anymore. 
Because down deep inside, I know your heart is not set on me. You're all tangled up in other things so much that you don't think about me. You're all tangled up with so many things that you don't think biblically in the world you live in. My friend, that's one of our biggest struggles in our nation, in our world, is that so many people, not just in America, but all around the world, people think more politically than they do biblically. They think about what, what's popular, what's, what's the modern message of the day. God says, I want you not to worry about your level of popularity as my followers. I want you to be concerned about whether your life is a reflection of what I have told you to live and be in God's word. If you look up the sermon that old Charles Haddon Spurgeon, preacher from a long, long time ago, wrote about Amos chapter 6, verse 1, where Amos 6, 1 says, Woe, woe to you that are ease in Zion. Woe to you that are just feeling good about yourself. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said, there are three kinds of people when it comes about doing justice and caring for the needs of others. There are three kinds of people. The first kind of person is the apathetic person. The apathetic. Uh, they, don't, they don't care. That they, don't, they just don't care. People are in need, they don't care. People are oppressed, they don't care. People are dying around the world in various things, they don't care. They're just apathetic. They're just apathetic. Uh, he says that the second kind of folks are, are, are the folks that are just so self-indulgent. They're just self-indulgent. Uh, in other words, uh, they are the ones that are so involved in living the good times. They are so involved in all that they have and all the resources that they have and all the luxury that they have and all the hobbies that they have and all the stuff that they have. They, 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 why, why would I worry about somebody else? Why would, I be, why would I care? I work for this. This is mine. This belongs to me. That's their problem, not my problem. It's every man for himself. The self-indulgent. I'd say that's prominent today. I'd say apathy is prominent today. And then he said the last one is the procrastinator. That's one who's always talking about it, always tweeting about it, blogging about it, liking, liking Instagram and about all kinds of things of justice and helping the needs of others, but never doing one single thing about it. Always waiting for another day. And then Spurgeon says, and then there are the righteous. And then there are the righteous of God. And the righteous of God, you know what they're concerned about? They're concerned about the needs of others. Listen to me. What I'm saying is this. There's nothing wrong with having things. There's nothing wrong with living. I, I have lived, I am very well aware in my life, I have lived a privileged life. I can't change that. That's the way it is. That's the way my life was. And I'm grateful to God for all things. I had loving parents. I lived in the same home all my life. I never wanted for a meal. I started working when I was 13 years old. I've never been without a job in my life. I have a loving wife, a loving son and daughter-in-law. I have a wonderful church I pastor. God's people have fulfilled their responsibility and cared for our needs over the years in all of 30 plus years of ministry. I have lived, I've had opportunity of education and learning and growing and developing still to this day. I have had a privileged life. The question is, will I take all that God has given me and will I just say, no, that's just mine? Or will I say, God, you've been so good to me. How can I give away to others? How can I give my life away to others? How can I give away all that you've done for me to others? That's why Paul says, why did Paul say in Romans? He said, I am a debtor. I am a debtor to the Jew and to the Greek. What he's saying is I'm a debtor to everybody. You know why? Because I'm so privileged that I know the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so privileged. Do you understand that you, if you are a follower of Christ, you are a debtor to all people. God has been so good to you because with your ears you have heard and with your heart you have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now you are a debtor to an entire world to tell them the message of hope, to do everything you can to make sure that that gospel message is spread around the world world that the needs of others are met God says that's what I want you to do with your life that's his problem with their people 
they were climbing on the backs of others to climb the ladder of success. God sends Mamus a message of some judgment. One, he says in chapter 7, he says, he says God says, I'm, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this. And you know what this is? This is, this is a plumb line. God says in Amos, I'm going to take a plumb line in uh, chapter 7. He said, this is what the Lord showed me. The Lord uh, was standing by a wall uh, that had been built true to plumb. With a plumb line in his hand, the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? Plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I'm setting a plumb line among my people. I'm setting a plumb line on my people. A plumb line is used to make sure that what is vertical is straight. I remember I was in a church back two or three years ago, a little Episcopal church that we worship sometimes when we're in Colorado. Father Charlie was doing a sermon and he brought out a plumb line. He preached on this passage. That was early when we first got there. I, I spent the rest of the summer just thinking about that passage and asking God, God, when you put a plumb line up to me, when you put a plumb line up to my heart, is it straight? Is it righteous? Or is it self? Is my heart apathetic? Is my heart self-indulgent? Is my heart a procrastinating heart? Or is it a righteous heart? Is it straight? Is it what you want it to be? I was not necessarily impressed with my answers, my honest answers into my own life. How would you be? Father, is my mind straight? Am, am I, if you put a plumb line up to the way I think, well, would you find me being true and blue to my philosophy of living? Would you find me to be true and blue to my political persuasion? Or would you put a plumb line on my mind and my thoughts and my attitudes? And would you say, yes, that's straight. That's according to my word. That's the way I want you to live. I want you to think the way I think. Whether it's popular or not. I'm going to pray give you ample time so that you can word the perfect email to tell me your thoughts about today. But I want to be loving and honestly and tell you, I'm not concerned about your thoughts, about your like or dislike into this message. It's what God has said. And it's the way God expects and desires for me to live and you to live. I am a debtor to all people. For I have the gospel, the greatest treasure of all in me. And there is a world, a world that desperately needs the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. Will we be the people of God that God desires? Would you bow with me? Father, I thank you for the power of your word. It is most certainly convicting. It is most certainly moving. It most certainly is irritating. It most certainly sometimes pushes us out of our comfort zone, rattles our cages, shakes our minds, causes us to be angry sometimes because we don't like what you've got to say, but it doesn't change it one bit. And you don't change the message one bit. You're not interested in changing the message, Father, uh, because it's 2020. You're not interested in changing the message because of a pandemic. Father, it's your word and it stands alone in my life and in the life of all who are listening today. May we live it and may we love it and may it be who we are as the people of God. In Christ's name I pray, amen.
Hey, next week, man, don't forget, we're going to be observing communion together. It'll be safe if you come to church. I promise you we'll be uh, do everything we can to make sure you're safe and coming and sharing communion with us. But if you're going to do it at home, get those elements ready. We'll see you next week. God bless you. Have a great week. Stay strong. Stay in the word of God and be who God wants you to be. God bless you.